Well, I have 12 noon and Dr. Vanette's our lone uh, customer today. So we'll, we'll get this recorded and get this up and going. So welcome to our final pick um, committee for the school year. Um, and we're kind of excited to present um, some summer learning um, that's going to occur in at um, at learning opportunities for our students as we need to go forward to after the pandemic. And then we're going to get into our equity audit, um, that next step in our DEI process. And I'm going to hand it off to our assistant superintendent, no one else. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here today to uh, share with you information about summer school and our equity audit. If you could advance to the next slide, DeAndre. We want to start our conversation grounded in our vision to lead with respect, trust, and courage, ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, and enable all to achieve success. Next slide, please. As I said, our agenda is uh, summer learning and equity audit. We hope you will see direct connections back to our vision statement in our efforts to really ensure that all of our students have the opportunity to be successful. Next slide. I'll draw your attention uh, to the graphic on your screen. If you were able to join us in previous PIC sessions, we've discussed that continuous improvement is our new way of thinking and working. It's ongoing, it's iterative, it's responsive, and MTSS is our framework or our system of support to equitably address student needs and help them reach their full potential. Within MTSS, there is a tiered approach Really the simplest way to describe this is at tier one uh, is where we have the universal experiences for all students, both academically and social emotionally. And when you approach tier, twos and, tier two and three, those include the additional supports and services that students need to meet our expectations. So I draw your attention particularly to the component that's circled, selection and implementation of instruction, interventions and supports direct connection to our work with summer school. So as we move into this conversation, I just wanted to frame your thinking through MTSS. We will continue to do that when we engage in conversation because it is our framework for uh, really doing the work uh, of the district. Uh, next slide, please. We're fortunate to have had higher rates of in-person learning this year than most other schools across the state and nation. And I think we were really pretty fortunate also to offer a solid virtual learning program to students and families who really needed that mode of learning. Our teachers and support staff and administrators worked really hard and with great intention this year to provide students with the best possible learning experience. But we have evidence to show that some of our students have unfinished learning and they really need additional services and supports to meet our expectations, to learn the key concepts and standards for their grade level or for their particular course in the secondary. So the MPS Summer Learning Program is one way that we're providing these additional opportunities. Students were invited to our summer program using a selection criteria that we have grounded in data. And we're looking forward to each student's summer experience, their instruction, the intervention, uh, the support that they'll receive through summer learning, that it will be personalized to meet their specific needs and address that unfinished learning. It's probably a good time for me to uh, mention that, well, much of the conversation around summer learning is about student needs and some of the gaps that they have because of that unfinished learning. We really want to also focus on student strengths. We're looking forward to our, our summer school teachers really drawing on individual student strengths and leveraging those for success. And while we're talking about teachers, we'll also know uh, we're excited to have as many teachers as we have stepping up for summer school. Uh, we believe that when students have that strong connection with a caring adult, typically one from their school or maybe one from the classroom that they already know, that that is really going to support their social emotional well-being and just open the channels for learning even more. Next slide, please. 
I wanted to share just a quick moment, some of the funding structures that we have available to us. The state and federal government has recognized the unique challenges and circumstances that COVID has created for both student learning and student well-being and are providing supplemental funding and guidance to support not just summer programs, but other strategies and approaches and programming that we can have throughout the school year. So I uh, wanted to recognize that we'll use those funds to the extent possible. As with most funds, uh, supplemental funds, there are parameters, criteria, and some limitations. So we're gonna do our best to maximize those funds. We also have a long history of providing summer learning in our schools who qualify for Title I Part A supplemental funding. We will access and utilize those funds again this year, specific to Central Park and to Plymouth. We are also really thankful that the summer food program can continue. So we're gonna partner up uh, with our food service Sorry. and ensure that students have Sorry. access to food, whether it's the learning mode where they're going to be physically in a building for a period of time and can eat meals right at school, or whether they grab and go and take those meals home uh, to, to eat at home, we're going to maximize our summer food program. And the last is really just a shout out to the Midland Lions Club. We had an opportunity to partner with them. They gave us a really wonderful donation of funds to purchase high interest books for students. And we look forward to, again, finding an opportunity for students to have some joy this summer, identify books that will really spark their interest and build on their love of reading. So thank you to the Midland Lions Club for that. Uh, I'm going to transition over to Mr. Schroll. Thanks for being with us, Paul, who will share some details about uh, summer programming for elementary. Thank you, Penny. Um, yes, yeah, so the, uh, the elementary principals have been working really hard at recruiting uh, teachers uh, and aligning those teachers with the uh, students who we know need a little bit of a boost through the summer or uh, due to learning loss. Um, or lack of progress, we know that we need to help these students, um, whether it's due to COVID or whether there are other issues that are affecting their lives. We know that probably more than ever, this summer's, summer school is an extremely critical component to them being successful in the future. So we uh, have a list of students that is growing. It's right around 300 students, but I think it may um, be a little bit larger than that once uh, final numbers come in. Uh, there will be a focus uh, similar to the school year for literacy and numeracy, right? So reading and math. Uh, the learning models will be uh, both individual uh, tutoring model as well as small group. And we are keeping these groups very small intentionally so that we have uh, similar skill levels so that we can be very um, uh, specific in the interventions that we offer. And um, so those are going to take place again in uh, various buildings. They're going to be taking place starting in June and ending in August. Some are going to be a little bit shorter or some are going to be a little bit longer. Again, we're trying to tailor these being flexible but tailoring them to the students' needs. Next slide, DeAndre. Uh, flexibility has been one of our uh, mantras uh, for this summer, being as broad as we can through the summer, um, aiding families with transportation needs that they may have that would otherwise prevent a student from attending. Um, definitely, and i um, very pleased to hear that the food service is going to be um, connected to the summer school. And so those students will, uh, I don't know any child in elementary that refuses food. And uh, we have great food service here. And so I'm really happy that that is a part of it. We also have the support of our paraprofessional educators. So they will be assisting teachers, they will be assisting students and also uh, teacher guided ways. Uh, so they'll be reading with students, they'll be reading to students, they'll be working on math um, computation skills and uh, drilling with students as well. So uh, again, that's going to provide us more one-to-one -one, um, interaction with students. So we know that's where they make their greatest gains. Uh, we're not going to leave our friends who are still not real comfortable uh, back at school behind. So there will be some virtual uh, uh, offerings and um, those are going to probably um, occur in a very 
a one-to-one -one basis, mostly one-to-one -one basis. So again, just as a, um, a summary, very flexible scheduling starting on the 14th of June, ending on the 12th of August. And uh, we're just gonna teach up as many kids as we can. Uh, we know that we have a critical component that is uh, in currently in second grade that will face a very important third grade read by grade three law. Uh, and so there's a big focus for that. There's a, a big focus and big numbers in our K-1-2 cohorts. So I'm very pleased uh, that that's taking place. And I'm excited to see how uh, the summer rolls out. I would love for us to do this two or three summers in a row, uh, fingers crossed for funding. And um, I think that's it for the elementary. Uh, I don't know if I open up for questions at this time because I've never been in a PIC meeting uh, this year. So I don't know how that rolls, but um, I'm happy to answer a question if there are any from anyone in the group. Stay until the end, Paul. Okay, great. And we'll take questions at the end, great. Fantastic. And Tila, thanks for being with us to talk about middle school summer learning. Hi, good afternoon. Um, the middle school, similar structure to the elementaries. Uh, Dirk DeBoer, the principal at uh, Northeast and I in collaboration with Allison Cicinelli in our curriculum department have been collaborating for some time now trying to create the um, ideal situation for our middle school students. We both buildings invited probably approximately 120 students from each building. Uh, we are looking at having about 40 students both virtually and face to face attend our summer schools. Similar to the elementary school, we are focusing on literacy and math. Um, these uh, students that were invited, we based it on multiple data points. We looked at their NWEA scores. Both schools um, identified students that scored in essentially the bottom 20th to 25th percentile on their NWEA scores. Uh, students that received non-completes in their virtual classes and uh, students that attended face to face this year and earned ease in their courses and uh, teacher recommendations. Those were the data points that we used to determine what students we would specifically invite to summer school. Um, our learning models are, uh, we have an MPS face to, we call it face to face, but we have an MPS teacher facilitated model. Uh, those students, uh, Jefferson students will be going to Dow High um, if they choose or if they need, they'll be transported. Uh, we're using our school bus system to get them to and from uh, some learning opportunities. And then Northeast students will be attending their summer opportunity at uh, Midland High School. Uh, they will have um, either math or um, ELA certified teachers in the face-to-face -face option. That program will run, right now we have it with running at two sessions, but we're not seeing that we would, would necessarily need that. So we might be running one session and that session would be 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. However, we do have the option to open that a second session up from 12 to um, uh, three. With similar to the elementary schools with a lunch in between, and even if they're not participating in both sessions, they still have the opportunity to receive uh, lunch after their morning session before they get on the school bus. We're still working the logistics of that out, but that is our hope. Um, so that is our face-to-face. -face. They would be working on the power standards or standards identified by those face-to-face -face, uh, teachers. In addition, they, those teachers will have access to the Edgenuity curriculum should they want more of a specific um, pacing guide that they wanted to reference. The second uh, model that we will be using is our Boost Edgenuity. Um, that, uh, those are students that would do a virtual option as opposed to coming to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, that number is quite small in both buildings of students that have opted or have chosen to do the virtual, but those students would be using Edgenuity and it's our boost. So what that means is they will um, take a diagnostic assessment and determine where they fall specifically in that specific course. 
And then before each unit, they'll take an assessment. And what it does is it kind of trims the fat. There's no nice, nice to know for the students. They are only focusing on the, um, the standards that they individually need to work on so that there's not a lot of uh, downtime or they're not mulling through content that, they, that they're already um, capable of doing. Uh, they do have access to an MPS teacher. Both buildings have an ELA certified teacher and a math certified teacher that are uh, that will be doing uh, check-ins with students, but that are also available for students should they have uh, math specific or ELA specific questions. Uh, DeAndre, next slide, please. And this, I have already spoken a little bit about this, but this is essentially the breakdown. Um, the MPS face-to-face -face teacher facilitated courses would be uh, a four week program starting July 12th and it will run through August 6th. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's three hours per day, either from eight to 11 or 12 to three. Uh, lessons will be planned and delivered by MPS teachers. Um, and then the boost is of course, as I mentioned, um, virtual. That's an eight week course. Uh, starting June 14th to August 13th. Students will log in virtually an estimated one hour per day. We're trying to limit the amount of uh, the login time. Uh, lessons will be provided, as I mentioned, by Edgenuity, and then we will have that MPS teacher available. And again, those numbers are pretty small. If I may just touch upon the teacher facilitated courses, right now the maximum small group size is eight students per teacher per session, which is a pretty uh, manageable number. We're trying not to exceed eight so that they can get that individualized uh, support. Next slide. Thanks, Thank you, Tila. Tila. So the high school uh, summer learning, uh, both high schools had well over 100 invites that they, they sent out to their students. Um, it was based on Credit. So if, if somebody had failed a course, and we had numerous students, especially first semester, who failed uh, a couple different courses when they were when they went virtually. So our hope is um, the majority of those students who failed virtually will come face to face this summer. And an estimate is 100. If we send out 200 to 250 invitations, we are ecstatic to, to get 100 students um, that will do it. We hope obviously it's more. It is a focus on that credit recovery. So they have uh, not earned credit in classes, mostly, uh, as everybody said before, ELA or math, um, but we possibly uh, will run uh, science and social studies as well. It depends on how many students sign up. Uh, but those numerous uh, virtual failures from first semester are the reasons that hopefully our face-to-face -face will be um, pretty large. DeAndre, look over there. Thank you. The face-to-face -face will be different uh, when it comes to the different schools. So middle and high chose to go right after school. So June 14th through July 9th. Uh, and then Dow High did July 12th through August 5th. These are the credit recovery face-to-face -face courses. What we're hoping is a lot of students will sign up to be there all day. So they'll have a three hour increment from 8.30 to 11.30. Then they'll have lunch and then they'll have another three hour uh, from 12.30 to 3.30 to where they're doing maybe English in the morning and math in the afternoon. That is the hope so that they can make up as much credit as possible um, in that four week time. People did a great job explaining the booster courses. That is another option as well um, to where they can take a test and see exactly where they are and then just work in those areas uh, to improve and try to get credit. Credit is the key uh, at the high school to catch them up. We don't want them to fall behind. We wanna make sure that next year they're 10th graders or if they're currently 10th graders, the following year they're juniors. So, and then ingenuity courses are always there for all areas. And, and I put ICE on there. ICE is uh, initial credit earning. Uh, so students have always done that in the summer as well. So anybody can take it in whatever class is possible. I wanted to tell you, I know that Midland High in particular has up to 14 teachers. Uh, and most of those, the, all of the ELA and math uh, can have a co-teacher as well, depending on the number of uh, special education students that they have. And they were hoping to do a science, probably biology. Uh, and they were also hoping to do um, 
either a U.S. history or a world history, depending on the number of students who have filled those courses who sign up to come in. Um, and obviously, transportation and food services are included. So as long as it's credit recovery, it's, it's trying to get those credits back, um, it's, it's paid for, it's free. That uh, only thing I added on the bottom is the, the ingenuity courses. If you're taking something for initial credit earning, that's the only time that, that we have to pay. So high school is is rolling along, and I know that they're taking both of the middle schools with them um, because we have so much construction this summer. So um, we're hoping we have a lot of students sign up. Hopefully, a lot more than not. Do. Thanks for that, Steve. And um, when we're looking at overall how summer school fits into the big picture with the work that we're doing with continuous improvement and as Penny mentioned earlier, multi-tiered system of supports, that whole focus on providing timely, uh, timely intervention or timely supports for students who might need some additional support is pretty critical. And so this uh, continuous improvement process is, is a process. When we're looking at this particular graphic, I know we've presented on both the continuous improvement process as well as MTSS at PIC in, in the past. Just as a reminder, this is the pinwheel for the five components for the multi-tiered system of supports. And this particular program for summer school, all of the programs that we're gonna be offering do fit and align with both our multi-tiered system of supports as well as continuous improvement. So just wanted to pause here. I think it's a really great time to open it up to questions because um, we're also going to be transitioning here in just a minute to talk a little bit about the equity audit and how that work also uh, aligns with the bigger picture. So what questions might you have around summer school at any of the levels? And it's open to anyone. All right, if not, that's okay too. Quick question, uh, if, is there uh, any opportunity for uh, students who have not been selected to participate in these programs uh, by need to participate by choice? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we've focused on this year is making sure that we are providing uh, uh, the, the right, uh, the right uh, supports for those that need it. And so we were pretty strategic in identifying students and recommending students at the different levels uh, using a selection criteria to invite them uh, based on the needs that we've identified. We also prioritize literacy and math and um, those that need those specific areas uh, for additional support. And does anyone else have anything to add to that? I'll just supplement that, Allison, with a note that our supplemental funding that I mentioned on one of the first slides, uh, some of the, the limitations, the criteria we have are to focus on students who have that unfinished learning and show a need for additional support. We also uh, recognize that enrichment and advancement is really an important part of MTSS and it's an important part of Midland Public Schools. However, we know that there are multiple community partners offering summer camps and summer learning experiences that are very enriching and rewarding. So we encourage families who might not qualify for our summer school to take advantage of those community partnerships. Thanks, Penny. What other questions might you have about summer school? All right, so um, this is kind of a transition point from uh, talking about summer school to looking at some of the work that we've been doing uh, along, the, along the lines of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, strategy. And so when we're talking about continuous improvement, um, we know summer school certainly is a part of it, but it's also bigger than that. Continuous improvement utilizing the multi-tiered system of supports framework is really about equity for all. And this slide, this slide's not new for, for, for uh, this particular group, but it, we talk about the reason why we do continuous improvement is for equity. It's about creating a culture of inquiry. 
It's about dismantling systemic barriers to learning opportunities uh, rather than addressing achievement gaps. And it's about changing individuals and systems. I know that we've spent uh, quite a bit of time in some of the previous meetings talking about this, this idea that we know that academics is important and we don't wanna lose sight of that. And we still take a look at our data and we identify areas where uh, some students aren't uh, meeting the same expectations as other groups of students. But when we identify our root causes, we're really looking at some of the systemic pieces of which we need to um, make some adjustments. Again, looking at the assets of students that, um, that was previously mentioned, as well as looking at the places in our systems where we can make some improvements. So with that said, we have some other work that we're looking at and how all this fits into the big picture. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to DeAndre to pick up from here. Thanks, Allison. Um, and to echo the work uh, that we have been engaged in and continuing to um, work towards, I wanna bring up our uh, DEI strategy um, that was implemented uh, last summer. Um, and kind of as we get into the equity audit process, um, just have us think about um, one, how the equity audit uh, will inform us of our five key focus areas here and also attribute and enhance the work with uh, continuous improvement. Um, that the DEI strategy was um, uh, put together prior to the continuous improvement work. Um, there's tons of alignment and eventually um, it will just be completely ingrained uh, equity at the center um, and it just be a part of our uh, DNA and just what we do as a district and not a sidebar or a, um, a, a add on at the end. It just becomes how we operate. And um, as far as our five focus areas, uh, governance, um, as I said, institutionalized equity and inclusion in our policies and our guidelines and practices. Um, leadership uh, we continue to develop strong leaders uh, who steward equitable and, and inclusive culture um, and what that looks like is um, just enhancing our learning our development into being uh, cultural responsive uh, leaders um, and our customers when we think of customers we think of our students our families our stakeholders uh, making sure everyone's experience um, through these mps walls um, is a good one uh, and community engaging with like minded uh, organizations, individuals in the community and leveraging those relationships into collaborating and um, partnering uh, in this effort. Which takes us to reputation. Um, we, we want to um, set the standard. We want to be the leader um, in Midland County in the Great Lakes Bay uh, region and in this equity work. Um, we want to bring surrounding districts surrounding communities along with us um and partner with them as we you know continue along this journey um and i'll touch on the equity audit uh, process um the audit itself what our expectations for the final report are and um touch briefly on the timeline so the selection process um in january rfp a request for proposals uh, went out uh, to our network and outside of our network. We received a total of 18 uh, proposals by the due date in March. Um, and since then, um, with the initial review uh, by myself and our team, um, narrowed the proposals down to six um, proposals and using a rubric uh, that we use for uh, typical vendor um, selection um, and tallying up um, points or scorecard. And once we got to the uh, final six, um, I conducted reference checks, um, looked review resumes, collected notes um, about the organization's experience and the groups and school districts that they work with. We wanted to intentionally work with K-12 experience organizations. And we took those six and reviewed them with the curriculum team together um, had candid discussions, uh, brought up questions, um, a thorough review of the notes and everything collected in the proposals um, to get to a, a, a final three proposals. Um, then for, <clears throat> excuse me, phase two of that was to, again, throughout this process, transparency. Uh, transparency uh, will be key, is at the forefront of this work moving forward. Um, and so I wanted to involve 
as um, many stakeholder um, touch points as possible. Um, and so I gathered a group um, of us students, teachers, um, admin um, together, uh, provided them the materials prior to this meeting. I wanted um, you know, to utilize their fresh eyes, kind of their thoughts, ideas of what the equity audit is uh, and kind of just bring that nuance to the conversation. And I asked them what stood out to them, what are the things they liked um, and what questions um, did they have? And so we got it to a top two. And so in phase three, um, a, a team uh, conducting or consisted of myself, um, district admin, secondary and elementary principals um, conducted interviews with the final two. Um, and at this point, um, we felt like we had a solid um, uh, selection process with the final two. We didn't think we could go wrong with either or. Um, uh, that's why the, we had very you know, good, informative um, discussions during the interviews. And what stood out, uh, we ended up selecting Insight Education Group. Uh, what stood out to us about them was their racial equity uh, framework. Um, and just thinking back to kind of what spurred uh, this journey um, is uh, racial equity as the start. That was the, um, you know, kind of the elephant in the room, um, in essence, like that spurred uh, this journey. And through that, we were intentional in asking and ensuring um, that they would cover multiple um, dimensions of diversity uh, throughout their audit. Um, and as of May 17th, um, the board approved us entering into a contract. Um, and so we signed that, sent it on its way. And um, Penny and I have already uh, had a few conversations. Our next touch point uh, will be in June, where we will establish uh, regular touch points, uh, scheduling uh, surveys and focus groups. And this will be, uh, this isn't the full team, but Britt Britton and Jessica Wilson will be our team interfacing uh, with us primarily. Um, and the Insight Education Group's team is comprised of individuals who are um, K-12 experience. Um, they are principals, curriculum um, leaders, um, and people uh, used to working in the K-12 system and used to um, gathering you know, data, qualitative data, and aggregating and offering um, best recommendations that are tailored to the needs of our district. Um, and, and this is just uh, sort of the methodology of us selecting the uh, proposals through that initial uh, review. I'll give you a sec to uh, look at that. Here's a glance at their uh, racial equity framework. Uh, so if we look at our structure systems and resources we utilize um, you know, through the uh, data collection, they'll look through our community and culture, um, what racial equity looks like in the workforce. Um, you know, as we, as Penny um, puts it, we are educators as well as employers. Um, so as, as, as student centered, um, as his work is, we'll also take a look um, at um, the climate and culture of our employees, our teachers, our staff, um, and so forth. Um, we'll look at professional learning and growth um, opportunities. So as we're going through this um, audit uh, with the updates, um, with the engagements, um, at, uh, while we're going through that, um, we'll also be building out our own capacity um, to engage uh, with this work so that you know, once we get the recommendations, we're not just left not knowing how to, um, you know, handle or interpret it. Um, we will also be gaining knowledge along the process. Um, and curriculum and instruction um, and learning will be um, looked at and reviewed as well uh, to ensure that we are providing the most culturally responsive um, uh, educational resources uh, to our students. And again, um, we want to ensure transparency uh, throughout the process. So we will be um, with our next meeting, we will establish um, uh, regular uh, touch points updates. Um, what I um, have been told is I'll get a weekly update of the process of where we're at, what else needs to be done. Uh, there will be a midway 
through the midway point of the audit, um, they will provide us an update of trends they have so far, uh, or they noticed so far, and it's kind of some action items we can take um, in the meantime um, to um, while we wait on the conclusion of the audit. And what I would like to point out as well is this audit isn't just to uncover, um, you know, that we're a you no know, bad district, uh, that we're do all, doing all these things wrong. It will also bring to light um, some of the positive things we have going as well and what we can enhance and elevate um, throughout our process because you know, we, this is a great um, district. Um, the purpose of this is to ensure that all of our um, students, all of our stakeholders and families have the opportunity to achieve um, success as well. And with the final report, uh, we'll come with um, recommendations. Uh, as I said, like throughout the process, we'll be building on our capacity, um, taking uh, action steps. And by the final report, um, that'll be the end of the contract with them. They're to provide us recommendations. And it'll be up to um, district team and uh, building teams to um, prioritize and determine um, some action items regarding those recommendations once we receive them. And a look at the type of data um, that will be collected in what ways. So there will be surveys um, going out. Uh, and everything prior to going out to buildings will be uh, run through myself and the team um, here at the district level um, to ensure um, cohesiveness and make sure it like, fits uh, what we're looking for and what we need. So surveys will go out to staff, students, families, and caregivers. And from these surveys, they will inform questions and work groups for focus groups that will be um, conducted. And they, can, they will be made up of uh, various uh, stakeholders uh, within the district. And we um, would like to look forward to those uh, being broad and having, you know, again, candid conversations about experiences and perceptions of not only our students, but of our uh, faculty and staff as well. And data from uh, focus groups will also inform individual um, interviews is kind of how um, Insight sees that process going. And um, we will be leaning on our uh, building leaders, our principals, uh, to help us um, determine uh, who will be you know, best to um, represent us, represent our multifaceted, um, diverse population in these focus groups. And for our final um, report, we'll be looking for, again, our strengths um, across the district, things we're, we're already um, doing well and ways to enhance that. Um, and our recommendations, um, we would like them to be research-based best practices. Um, again, they have tons of experience working in K-12 system, um, various you know, racial makeups um, that um, some that are very different than ours and some that are uh, very similar um, to ours. So we will trust in their expertise to uh, uh, tell us uh, where we are and where we can be. And we'll be doing that by reviewing um, student success, uh, business and finance, where we're allocating our funds, uh, what if you know what we say is important is matched by where we are spending um, our money, uh, human resources, recruiting and retention um, of our staff um, and recommendations there. Um, if our curriculum and instruction is from culturally responsive uh, resources and content and our policies and practices, uh, including our student handbook. Um, and just another visual of the um, timeline that I touched on throughout um, received proposals in March, um, going through the selection process, board approved in May, um, data collection will begin in June um, and July, um, focus groups will occur around August and September once we um, kick off the fall and get uh, students and uh, families back uh, and teachers back um, and ready uh, to engage. So, and by December, um, looking for the uh, final report. And with that, um, we opening the floor to questions um, or comments. We do have a question from Jen Ringgold. She asks, will principal be the only gateway that students and families can be a part of the data collection or can families volunteer to engage? 
It's a great question. And I think, um, again, this is um, in, develop in development currently at, with that process. We have regular uh, touch points with the Insight team. And that is definitely a question um, we will ask uh, their advice on. So thank you. Yeah, Andre, if I might, I'll just add, uh, Jen, one of the pieces that is important to the process is that we uh, seek voices that aren't typically heard as well. So we're going to trust Insight, as, as DJ said, to guide us in that selection criteria. The surveys will be uh, broad-based among the groups that were listed, parent, families and parents and students uh, and staff, and then it narrows a bit for those focus groups and for the, the interviews as well. But, but there will be a touch point for everyone through that survey process. If I might, I, I think just to um, expand on Jen Ringgold's question is just, um, I think my concern with principals choosing um, as much as I, I fully appreciate what Penny is saying, um, but I feel like the principals tend to know the really excelling students' families and the really struggling students' families. And I really want to make sure those who are in the middle have their voices heard as well. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, and I agree. And um, to echo Penny, um, we'll be um, intentional about um, selecting and discovering um, voices that aren't typically typically heard, and that will be a challenge um, for us and one that we will pose uh, for our principals as we begin to engage. Any other questions? Okay. Nothing in the like chat. I was just going to say, it looks like we were pretty thorough in our description. We really thank you for your continued engagement and support of Midland Public Schools, your engagement in these PIC meetings. Uh, this is our last for the year. Mr. Shero, did you have any closing comments or are we ready to wrap up? It is our last of the year and um, I think we're going to adventure in a new format possibly next year as um, this, this seems to be uh, maybe losing its pace. And so if you have thoughts or ideas, we'd be glad to uh, have to share those. Um, but we're thinking that um, podcasting may fall, fall into the theme of what we're doing and trying to get our message out and still having the two-way interaction component of it in some capacity. But certainly we're open to future topics as well. Each summer, typically we sit down and we try to uh, draw out a schedule of topics. Um, of course, they change throughout the year depending on our needs, but we try to do that as well. So if you have input, please provide them to us as we begin to plan for next year or what PIC might look like in the format and the content. Thanks for attending. And some of you regular ones we can count on attending. So we like that. So thank you very much. And hopefully uh, next year, you know, we're a little more face to face, a little more personal than this format has been as well. So certainly. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.